And they created a, an hour-long sports show on a Saturday morning called Turf Talk with the inimitable Glyn Tucker, who was an overpowering man, amazing personality, loved his horses, knew everything about racing. And I became his little shadow and I'd wander around the country doing all these little film jobs on, on horses that were very famous or jockeys or trainers. And I just loved it. I just thought this is the ultimate for me. It was so exciting. So the end result was I got really a strong love of racing about that time as well as hosting Turf Talk. And Turf Talk was split into the half hour racing segment and the second part of it was a little quiz show modelled in very similar to Game of Two Halves. And I would have three... Uh, sportsmen on one side, including Graham Thorne, the, the famous Graham Thorne. And on the other side, I had uh, Bruce Taylor, the cricketer, and they'd have their guests, and we'd run a competition. I tell you what, it was basic computer uh, language. We would, uh, we would end each round with something like, um, OK, let's check the points, and through my earpiece, I could hear the production secretary, Margaret Leslie, up in the, in the control room going, one and two and three is four and seven, that's a nine, uh, nine points. And I'd be saying, so Bruce Taylor's team has nine points. And on the other side, Graham Thorne's team has three, five, seven, eight, twelve, coming through my ear, uh, 12 points. So it was basic. It was pretty basic. But it was, it was a good little show. I loved doing it. Uh, 1976, it was the first live telecast of an Olympic Games and I was to host it in a studio. Basically, hello and welcome everyone, Montreal Olympics about to begin, let's join the opening ceremony with our commentator Keith Quinn. Unfortunately Keith Quinn wasn't there, there was no link, all we had was music coming from the main stadium. So I get the call to say that I'm going to have to carry the telecast without any notes. I'd done no preparation of any note because my role was very simple. So I sat there thinking this is going to be the worst experience of my life. So they concocted an amazing system where Keith Quinn would phone the control room in Montreal, who would then phone the control room in Avalon, who would then talk to my earpiece. And so they would then give me all this information. Australia, a team of 242 athletes being led by the sprinter Raylene Boyle. So I would come out with, and so Australia now entering the stadium, being led by Raylene Boyle with her 242, well, you can imagine, Keith Quinn, he was spitting tacks. He had a suitcase full of notes sitting underneath his commentary booth, ready to go, and he couldn't use any of them. And he was dirty ass. He, I don't think he's quite got over it yet, Quinny, to be honest with you. Well, I, I think I did it for about an hour and a quarter, and before I finally started getting some complaints about the lack of colour in the telecast. So the um, director, Harold Anderson, had said to me, you need to actually you know, introduce a bit more colour and excitement. So I said, well, there she is, Her Majesty the Queen, resplendent in a yellow coat and a yellow hat. And that was about as far as my sartorial descriptions were going at this stage. I did work on the 81 tour. Uh, that was a difficult time for everyone. Some of my colleagues refused to work on it. Uh, uh, was it a conscience thing? I think it was more a fact, uh, probably like a policeman, he had to turn up and do his job. Was I asked to be a journalist and do my job? I suppose in that sense I, I said I was. Uh, I had to stay above it, and I did. It, but it wasn't an enjoyable experience. I was at Rugby Park one day in the back of the bus with the All Blacks, while everyone was beating sort of uh, the hands on the side. And it was it was pretty scary stuff. Um, some would say you deserved it. In retrospect, tour clearly should never have taken place. Um, but as again, I think it's always easy to be wise after. And I got the opportunity to work with the lovely Lana, and the two of us became a real team. Um, that show ran for 1,250 episodes, um, which is the longest running game show I think that has existed. And um, Julian Mounter was the director general at the time, or the head of TV1. He couldn't believe I would do a game show. He was sort of like a bit patronising about, oh, stay in sport, don't do game shows. But uh, the money was pretty attractive. But um, I actually love the challenge of Wheel of Fortune because every day you had to come up with a different pattern. Um, we would record five shows in one day, we'd record 15 shows in three days, so we would reel them off and you know, you'd hardly have time to get changed out of one suit into another. Lana would be out of one dress, you wouldn't know which one she's going to come up with. And um, we, we built a great wee team, the production team was a lot of fun and they were the really great highlights. We'd fly to Wellington, do the three days of filming, jump in a little rental car, race to the airport to get the last flight back to Auckland and that was our life, that was really our life. But um, we did that for five and a half years. I'll probably tell you something that no one will ever believe. It, it actually rolled past me. 
When, I, when he said it, I sort of thought, oh, for awesome, yes, yeah, sure, that's fine. It didn't dawn on me at the time. And yet became such a, a talking point. About two years ago, I was walking down Fifth Avenue in New York, and coming towards me was a guy wearing a T-shirt which had, oh, for awesome. And I thought, well, doesn't that say something? The world knows about Wheel of Fortune. Oh, for awesome. But David, I think, he just got very confused at the time. And uh, it was a celebrity show. There's a lot of lightheartedness and a lot of fun. And uh, it was just a bad error on his part. And uh, I think I made him probably sound a bit better than he really was, but uh, by, by really ignoring it. It was the last ever live telecast of a Miss New Zealand show. Now, why would you do that? Well, most people thought I was mad. Uh, it, there was so much anti-feeling about Miss New Zealand shows at the time. But I set out to make that show a very much... Uh, I described every young woman on the show. I talked in, in the sense they weren't girls, and they were girls, they were 16, 17-year-olds, but I talked about all the young women. Of, and I, I remember the show, we recorded it in Hamilton, and it went out live, and it was a success. And uh, as I say, I put my name alongside it. I'm not uh, far from uh, embarrassed about doing that. It was another nice little challenge. The weekend, which was Gordon McLaughlin's Sunday morning show, I, I still I still hanker for a show like that. It was a great wee show, sitting there, opening up with a cup of coffee in your hand, the newspapers, and Terry Carter, the journalist who's since passed on, saying to Terry, what's the latest this morning? Oh, well, we've got a major upset here. The, you know, the polls are showing that National's on the way out, whatever. You know, we, we, it was very live. Um, and Kerry Smith worked on that show as well. And uh, so there was a really cool atmosphere. The only reason I did that was uh, Gordon McLaughlin took six weeks sabbatical to go overseas, and they needed someone to host it. And I got the role. We had one incident where Tim Finn, uh, I'm sorry, Neil Finn, was due to be our special guest, and he failed to show at 11 o'clock, and we had a full hour to go. So in the end, Vic Williams, the wine connoisseur, and Phil Leishman then chewed the fat over some of the best wines for one hour as we had lived our way up to midday to get out of it. Around about 97, uh, journalist Phil Smith, who's set up great Southern television and done very well, he approached me about doing a golf show. And he'd bought the rights to the golf show, if they ever existed, for a dollar of Mike Latin, the chief programmer at the time at TV One. And he said to me, I don't know how we're going to do this. He said, do you, would you like to be a part of it? And I said, oh, yeah, I'd love to. He said, you know, you, you, you'll front it. He said, I don't know whether I can pay you any money. He said, we should, should we just do a partnership? Probably his biggest mistake, really. But in the end, we did a 50-50 deal on creating the golf show, sponsored by people, well, companies like Air New Zealand and Top Flight and others. And we've had many banks, car firms on it ever since. It's been going 15 years. It's probably been the most satisfying role that I've had. Um, initially as an executive producer, producer with very good staff. We're a very small team. But we did enormous, an enormous amount of travelling. So I went, I've been all around the world. I've seen golf courses in virtually every country in the world. And we've gone in with a camera, very similar to what we're using, gone in with a camera, shot the course, featured all the, all the good bits, showed the hotels, the spas, and everything. I probably have more spas and hotels than anyone else. And uh, we've then come, brought that material back and said to the viewer, OK, here's your opening into a world that you'll never probably get anywhere near. And in that sense, I've felt it's a little bit of an escape. It's been like a travel escape. Air New Zealand holiday was for a couple of years, and uh, yeah, I love that. I mean, that was the ultimate job. Everyone wanted that job because it just meant that you actually travelled the world, you know, having a good time, being wine and dined. I travelled with a few uh, good directors, and I tell you what, they were merciless. We'd be on the go at 6.30 in the morning, we'd still be going at 10 at night. But, you know, we went to uh, some great places around the world, uh, particularly um, places like uh, York and Castle Howard and all those beautiful old uh, castles and houses. Um, went to Whitby, see where James Cook was. We did all the stories that you could do uh, through Australia, all around the South Island. I, did, I probably did three or four bungee jumps, which I'd rather have not done, probably affected my life ever since. But um, no, Holiday was a great show to do. I loved doing that. It's hard for me to appreciate that um, I've been doing this job for 42 years. I uh, did uh, some recent uh, closing links for my golf show and I felt quite sad because I felt that it might be the last time that I'm actually hosting a show and 42 years is a terribly long time. I'm incredibly proud of the fact that both myself, my brother Mark, have probably contributed 
to this broadcasting industry close to 80 years of television. And I don't think anyone else can claim that. Uh, I feel proud that I started hosting a show in September 71, and I was still capable of hosting a show in 2012, December. And if I can say my legacy is one of a natural broadcaster, someone who loved their job, uh, I've enjoyed the response I've had from, from the public. Um, but my legacy is I've lived the life of television in this country, and uh, I'm pretty proud of that.